Hi, I'm Randall Cooper. Welcome along to um, uh, La Trobe University. I'm here with Joe Kemp and we're going to talk hips today. Firstly, Joe, welcome along to the show. Thanks, Randall. Thanks a lot for having me. Now, you're a clinician with um, a lot of experience and you've also done a lot of research as well. One of your main areas of uh, expertise is uh, FAI, femoral acetabular impingement. Yep. Um, tell me about, a little bit about your uh, research in the past. So, um, my, I completed my PhD um, at the beginning of 2014 and in that project we were looking at people who had had hip arthroscopy um, specifically for FAI and associated pathology, so cartilage pathology and label pathology. And what we were trying to work out was what are the um, modifiable things that as physios we could change, those things like muscle strength, functional performance, etc., that have an impact on patients' outcomes, so their quality of life and their pain and those sorts of things. So we looked at a group of people um, post hip arthroscopy um, to try and identify what those impairments were and which of the impairments were most important to target when treating these people to try and optimise their outcomes. Okay. Um, most people, I'm sure, who are watching this know what FAI is, but what is FAI yep. and, and how does it's it develop? Yeah. It's a good question. So um, FAI relates primarily to the shape of the hip. So you can have either CAM FAI, which talks, which relates to extra bone at the head neck junction on the head of the femur, so you have your, your ball in your socket, um, or you can have pincer FAI, which refers to extra bone on the acetabulum. So in that case, you can either have a deep acetabulum or a backward facing retroverted acetabulum. So that's the shape of the hip or the morphology associated with FAI. But for patients to have FAI, they have to have pain and symptoms. Right. So there are a lot of people out there who might have the shape, the morphology, but if, if you if you don't have any symptoms, then you don't have FAI. I you see. just have the morphology. So it's so it's the shape of the hip and the associated pathology and pain that occurs because of that shape and then going into repetitive positions of impingement over time. And it's more a um, condition that affects younger people and middle age? Look, it tends to show itself first with younger people. So what we think happens is that if you have pincer impingement, that's something that develops um, as a very young child. Can um, The cam shape tends to develop in the growth years in adolescence, so between the ages of 10 and 15, that's when you get that extra bump of bone at the head neck junction. People start to show symptoms probably in their mid to late teenage years, right. but you can have symptoms right through until you're in, you know, into middle age, so into, you know, even into your 50s. And um, yeah, the patients that we look at generally are aged between 18 and sort of 50 to 55. My dad recently had a, um, a total hip replacement yep. and um, severe arthritis in, in one hip. And I do wonder whether he was a motor mechanic and I do yeah. wonder whether um, years and years of squatting down yeah. um, and getting himself into funny positions, particularly through his hips, yep. uh, would have an effect. And obviously as a physio, I see a lot of sports people mm -hmm. who get this because of um, what they do as well. Is your occupation or your sport mm -hmm. have anything to, the, to advance this kind of combined with what you just mentioned? Yeah, so look, I mean, if, if we just think about the hip OA group, um, not thinking about FAI first, occupation certainly is a risk factor for developing hip arthritis. So if you have a heavy manual type occupation, some studies are showing that you're more likely to get hip arthritis than if you don't. If we then take FAI into um, the picture, um, we know that people who have um, particularly CAM type FAI are much more likely to develop hip arthritis in later life and get hip replacements. But not everyone with that CAM FAI goes down that path and they, we don't yet know where, what the link between the type of sport, how much sport or occupation, um, whether that's related to why some people go down the path who have CAM FAI go down the path to arthritis and other people don't. So that's what we're, that's some of the research that's going on at the moment. We're just trying to find, find the answer to that. As a clinician who sees patients, um, what do you say to your patients about the long-term outcomes or yeah. long-term uh, uh, um, uh, problems associated with FAI? Obviously, again, being sports orientated myself, like so many athletes that I have who have got this, yeah. it's like just getting back out on the field. Yep. I couldn't care about what happens less. Mm -hmm. Is it something that's coming into your conversation a little bit more that this yeah. is something that needs to be addressed and thought about for the long term? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we see these patients, I always make it really clear that we don't really know um, the reasons why um, people, some people with FAI go down the path of arthritis, but we do know that if you have FAI, you are more likely to go down that path. How, how much? I mean, how, like, what's the, do you know the statistics of how many yeah, people Yeah, so basically, on? if you have, so when we measure FAI, it's all about the size of the bump of bone, and so you measure that with the alpha angle. So to get technically, uh, technical, if you have an alpha angle bigger than 83 degrees, so that's a fairly big bump of bone, then you're up to 10 times more likely to progress to hip arthritis than if you don't. So it, it, it's quite a higher risk, but in saying that, 
like I said, not every, most people with FAI don't end up with hip arthritis. So while you're much more likely, it's not a sure thing. So when we talk to patients, we let them know that there is a higher risk. We don't yet know what we can do to change that risk. So whether physio type interventions change it or whether surgery changes, a lot of people have surgery and hope that it's going to stop them getting arthritis, but we don't really know whether that's the case. So very open to them that you know you may end up getting arthritis and so we talk a lot about what are the strategies that you can use that may help reduce that risk not really having a lot of evidence for that yet sure yeah do you know the sequence involved in what goes from having fai to yeah. then um, gaining arthritis so for in knees for instance you know there was a lot of thought that if someone had an acl injury for instance yeah. there was actually the collision in the bones yeah. that caused microtrauma at the time and mm -hmm. then that just slowly developed into arthritis but there's been more recent thoughts about kind of like altered biomechanics mm. and the inflammatory cascade that's in yeah. there of all those times and all those factors may come yeah. together. Yeah. Is it a similar story for the hip? Look, we think it's a similar story, but again, we don't know for sure. But there are some um, good ongoing studies happening here at La Trobe that will hopefully answer that question. But what we think happens is that um, the repetitive impact sets up um, a number of different changes which may be inflammatory. So a lot of these people end up with synovitis in their hip, so inflammation forces and movement patterns may be related to it as well but whatever the cause um, it could be related to range of motion strength um, body mass index so if you're overweight that might be part of it the type of activity but all of those things come together in some people to you get the impact on the bone and that can cause bone related pain and then we think what happens is that could create labral pathology which then can progress to cartilage pathology and you get this synovitis and then that begins that um, process of going down the path to osteoarthritis. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about some of the um, common uh, things we see in FAI, such as lack of range of motion and strength yep. in a minute. Yes. But just one more question about kind of like how it develops. Yeah. Are there people at risk? Do you know if like, can you pick them early? And if yeah. you can, is there anything that we can do about it? So that's a really good question, and I guess that's another thing that we're, excuse me, we're trying to answer. We don't really know yet, but what seems to be the case is it seems to be a combination of your genetic profile. So we do know that if you have family members with FAI, you are more at risk of having FAI yourself. So there's definitely a genetic component, and then it also seems to be related to load. So if you do a lot of um, sport or activity that involves a lot of repetitive flexion and rotation right. in those growth years, so between mm -hmm. the ages of 10 and 15, mm -hmm. those two things together seem to be what disposes you so we don't really know um, it, exactly what combination and things and so uh, but there is a lot of conversation in some sort of sports medicine circles now that um, maybe we should be limiting how much of that um, repetitive flexion and rotation type sport that kids do in those sort of critical growth years. Well, we see it in sports overseas particularly in baseball where you know the kids um, used to have growth problems with their humerus bone uh, yeah. because of uh, yeah. how much they used to throw and pitch yep. and they put uh, pitch limits on them yeah you know they might be kind of coming around to similar things um, you know, right. for low limb here in Australia anyway. yeah that's right and I think you know we see it with cricket as well with the low back injuries that fast bowlers get they've now limited how many um, overs um, particularly adolescents can do and I think that variation in sports really important to just not do the same thing five times a week but try and give kids at that age a, a variety of different sports to do to try and minimize the likelihood of these sorts of problems. So one of the things you see obviously in, um, in FAI is, is a reduction in strength and also a reduction in range of motion. Talking about range of motion to start with, which are the most important things to assess when it comes to range? So um, I think it's important to look at the differences between range of motion that's associated with the severity of your condition, pain, etc., and range of motion that's related to the shape or the structure. So the lack of internal rotation range that you typically see um, seems to be related more to the shape and structure, but not so much to their symptoms. So um, our previous studies have shown that you like internal rotation range isn't associated with pain or anything like that, whereas flexion range is definitely the one that is associated with pain. And if you have um, less flexion range you're more likely to have more severe symptoms and pain so it's a good way good thing to measure to track their progress over time. Do you measure both equally though I mean is it is the internal rotation for instance a good measure of whether that pathology is or even your clinical condition I suppose is improving or not? Yeah so if I, if I have a patient that I'm treating over a period of time flexion range is the thing that I'll always measure at the start and end of every treatment because it really does let me know how they're progressing with their condition. I'll always measure internal rotation range at their initial assessment and then I might might measure it from time to time after that but it's not something that I do every time. Yeah. Okay strength yeah uh, so 
which muscles get the weakest? Is it, you know, I mean, a lot's talked about glute max. Yep. Um, but do you talk about specific muscles or is it more of a, a global weakness that's discussed? Look, we do, it depends a little bit on how severe the condition is. So if someone's had it for a longer time, then they're going to have more weaknesses in more muscles. But generally it's a global weakness, but the particular muscle groups that appear to um, be weak in this group and be associated with outcomes are the abductors and adductors and um, also the hip extensors, so particularly glute max. But we also look at trunk muscle strength as well. That's a really important thing because the trunk controls the pelvis and with the acetabulum sitting in the pelvis, whatever the pelvis is doing, it'll impact on the acetabulum and the degree of impingement. So trunk strength is another really important factor as well. Okay. Um, and then looking more distally through the chain too. So yep. yeah. Most of the time if people have FAI, it's a Traditionally, it's been quite a quick referral into an orthopaedic surgeon yeah. for surgery. Yep. Is that what's needed? Yeah, look, we do have a lot more evidence for surgery than for physio. Um, so, but even saying that, the evidence for surgery, the, hot, the quality of that is not great. So we have a lot of low level evidence, um, case series evidence that shows that um, there's a big, what we call a within subject effect size for hip arthroscopy. So what that means is the patient's measured pre-op, they have their surgery, they tend to be a lot better post-op. Um, but we don't have any randomised control trial evidence yet, but that's coming. There are a few trials underway. Um, the other thing that's important to remember is even though these people might get better with surgery, so they might have a score, say, of 40 out of 100 pre-op, so 100 being really good and 10, zero being really bad, so they're quite pretty bad, they might improve by 20 points, so they might get to 60 or 65 post-op. So 20 points seems like a big improvement, but even at 65, they're still a lot worse than a healthy person who would score 100 in that score. So while they improve, they don't go back to normal. They don't suddenly become the same as a person with no hip problems right. and never have any pain again. So it's important that patients have that expectation that, yeah, they probably will improve, but don't go into surgery thinking that you're going to be 100% perfect, never have any problems again. Okay, and what about the long-term outcome of surgery? Has there any, been any research and studies on that or have you got your own gut feel on whether that may influence um, A, let's say, return to sport for a longer period of time or B, particularly osteoarthritis down the track yeah. as well? Yeah, so they're the two things people are really interested in is how quickly can they get back to sport mm. and what's the risk of arthritis. So when we look at the studies that have looked at return to sport in arthroscopy, probably um, between, depending on the study, between, say, 50% and 80% of people get back to sport. Um, but again, we really need to follow that out with high quality sort of longitudinal cohort studies and also randomised controlled trials. Um, for arthritis, we don't have any evidence yet to, to see whether surgery that focuses on changing the shape of the hip and repairing damage to the labrum and cartilage, whether that actually changes that risk of arthritis or not. So no one's actually done that study yet again. We need good quality sort of natural history cohort studies that will show us whether that's the case or not. One area that's been under-researched as well for FAI is the effect of physical therapy or physiotherapy. Yep. And this is a nice segue into yep. what you're doing and congratulations also on you've been awarded a NHMRC fellowship, is that correct? Yep, that's correct, yeah. thank you. Can you tell yep. us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the fellowship's basically a four-year fellowship um, which I'll be doing here at La Trobe Uni. And what we're going to be doing is running a, a full-scale RCT looking at physio for FAI. So we're going to have people coming in who have symptomatic FAI, so they have to have pain, they have to have the shape of hip on x-ray etc and they'll get randomized to two different physio groups what are your outcomes what are you going to use how are you going to assess your people so we'll um we'll have our primary outcomes and secondary outcomes so our primary outcomes are basically pain and symptoms and quality of life so how how much does the intervention that we're giving them, the physio treatment, have an impact on those things that are really important to the patient? So we're going to use two scores, the WHO score and the IHOT 33 score, which are two outcome scores. But then we're also interested in measuring things like their muscle strength, their range of motion, um, their functional performance to see whether or not what we do changes those things as well. So they'll have three months of treatment. Um, so we measure them at baseline, they have their treatment, measure them at the end of the three months. We'll follow them up at the 12 month mark as well. And then ideally if we, you know, funding dependent, it'd be nice to follow them up even longer, you know, two years, five years, 10 years, and those sorts of um, time periods as well. So we get a really nice picture of, of, of how, what, you know, whether we, what we do works or not. What's your hypothesis? What are you hoping to, to see and also achieve with your study? Yeah, so what we're hoping to see is that probably both groups will improve because both groups are getting manual therapy and they're getting education. Um, my hypothesis is the group that has the really targeted intervention will have bigger improvements in those things, so they'll get more better than the other group, and, but also that we hope that we'll actually see things like improvements in muscle strength, 
um, improvements in functional tasks and those sorts of things in the group that's having the more targeted sort of ideal intervention. Excellent. Well, it sounds like a terrific study and again, congratulations on uh, being awarded this fellowship. It's uh, great for you and great for this university as well. And it's going to be great, obviously, for the, uh, for the public um, who have got hip problems. Yep. Joe, thanks very thanks much for Randall. joining us. Thanks, Randall. Great. Thanks for having me.